My name's Sean Compton. As uh, I appreciate the uh, introduction by Jim there. Um, like you said, uh, um, I'm going to be trying to give you some practical application techniques for tactical combat casualty care. Uh, some of these things um, have been kind of hard learned over uh, a number of years, and uh, what, what we're going to try to do is just give you a, a simple, stepwise approach to doing that. Um, I, I appreciate the uh, introduction there. I, I can tell you, though, that uh, I stand on the shoulders of giants. I learned at the knee of uh, Mike Hollingsworth, Cecil Keaton, and others, and uh, um, I owe a lot of what I've learned and what I'm going to show you uh, to, to them and, and their training of me and, uh, and others like me. And uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and start off. Um, what we're going to be doing is talking, um, uh, first of all, about uh, prefab tourniquets. I'm going to start off with a cat tourniquet. The, th this tourniquet is now being pushed in, and placed in uh, the IFAX pretty much across the Army and uh, across the spectrum. Uh, it's an excellent tourniquet, lightweight. Uh, the um, uh, learning curve is relatively uh, low. It is, uh, uh, takes up a lot, very, very little cube and is relatively easy to apply. Uh, I want you to, um, I'm going to point out a few things good and bad about the tourniquet and I'm going to do that for all the tourniquets. Uh, I think it's very important that we can, um, you know, look at things objectively and uh, put our best foot forward and have those soldiers. Th this is a critical thing that we've got to do. The number one preventable cause of death out there on the battlefield is uh, exsanguinating hemorrhage from normally from extremity trauma. Um, so this is um, an excellent device to fix that, but we, we need to uh, um, show you how to, you know, apply that and we need to train it ad nauseum so that those soldiers that are, that are applying it and, and ourselves uh, will do that under duress um, without any hitch. Um, the way this tourniquet is going to come in the package, um, like this right here, it's got a little uh, insert. Um, the thing about these inserts is kind of like with the, the uh, SAM splint, um, people frequently uh, throw that in the dirt along with the, the plastic wrapper and never read the insert. I would encourage you guys to, to do that and have your, have your folks read over that. Um, it's go the uh, tourniquet is going to come, when it comes in the package, it's going to be routed um, singularly through the friction adapter like that. Um, the purpose for that is so that it affords the operator a one-handed application technique um, so that he can place it over uh, a upper extremity and uh, go hook to pile and then use the, the, use the tourniquet or use the windlass. Um, what I want to point out with that though is um, that is only to be used in that kind of configuration singularly through the friction adapter uh, for upper extremity self-application. Any other time, and this is for upper extremity, lower extremity, it does not matter. Uh, any other time, that needs to be routed completely through the friction adapter for that thing to work. The, the issue here is this. Um, if, you, if you singularly go, go across like that and just go hook to pile, the, whatever compression and torsion that you're applying with the, um, with the windlass is, is going to be pulling on that Velcro solely. There's going to be no other thing other than hook pile, and I think you guys who've had some experience in the desert know that that hook pile of Velcro does not work very well with uh, blood and sand. So um, in any other instance other than self-application on an upper extremity, um, this thing needs to be routed like this. Got that? Okay. Um, now, let's talk about how we're going to apply this thing and uh, some methods for doing that. Like I said, it's going to be through here like this, and if you want to carry it in your kit, like that, that's perfectly fine. But there are some issues with that and I'm going to point those out. Um, if you apply this and loop this over, um, over the extremity, you are then going to have to uh, reroute this. Now, the, 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 here's the thing. Frequently people under duress uh, forget critical steps. Um, so with, with in, in saying and doing what I just showed you, you've got you've to enforce that through training. Those people have to know that when they slip that up on there, uh, they cannot just pull that down and go hook a pile on a, on a lower extremity, or even on an upper extremity for that matter, but on a lower extremity in particular, that will not hold that. Okay? So um, if you want to carry it in your kit so that you, you um, have to route it once you're over the extremity, that's perfectly fine. Uh, another methodology is to carry it in your kit like this. Um, where you've got it already routed, and you're going to basically, you know, do the sweep, cut down to it, um, pressure the uh, limb, and loop the extremity. Now, that poses some problems, particularly on the lower extremity, because it's going to take some dexterity. Um, 
to do and, and uh, it may be more difficult. The other, the other issue with having it like this is uh, that if it's a partial amputation, you, 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 you will not be able to get over all that mess and pick it up in unison to do that. So, uh, what, so in that case, you're probably going to have to um, you know, go ahead and unloop un it, loop the extremity like this, bring it down, go hook the pile all the way around, and then begin twisting your windlass. Okay? Just like that. This tourniquet has universal stays uh, um, so that you can go clockwise, counterclockwise, does not matter. Uh, then it's got a um, Velcro uh, safety that goes over to hold um, the windlass in place in the universal stays. Um, now, I'm going to point out something, and I, I want, and this is not, uh, you know, a bad thing on the cat tourniquet. I do this for all tourniquets, and I want you to kind of keep this in mind, that even though in, in a perfect environment, um, that will stay just like it is, and there's not going to be an issue. The, the problem here is that frequently, probably 80% of the time, you're so, th those soldiers are going to be evac'd off the field in a um, non-standard CASVAC vehicle. Um, there's going to be feet, rucksacks, uh, water, chow, every other thing back there in the back of that, and there's, there's always the potential for popping that free, okay? Um, uh, this is an excellent tourniquet, so I'm not, I'm not running it down, but what I would say to you is, uh, and I do this for all dressings, all tourniquets, um, that what, what I normally do is I go ahead and finish that with tape, circumferentially, three inch, or duct tape, 100 mile an hour tape, whatever you want to call it. It's going to go down just like that. And then I'm going to write right on it, T0905. And that's how he's going to go out. Now, I will, I will tell you that uh, all tourniquets that I'm going to apply, cat, doesn't matter, ranger ratchet even, I, I'm going to go ahead and put tape on that like that and finish it just like that. The, the, the thing I want you to take away is that these things, when you, you have, you have a, a very short time to um, apply these devices, and um, unlike um, when we're training and when we're in a, a kind of a more secure environment, uh, there, there may be uh, very little time. This may be the only thing that you do to this patient. And whatever you put on that has got to be bomb-proof. It's got to, it's got to survive the ride out. So um, I would just encourage you to reinforce that thing, whatever you put on it, whether it's a tourniquet, direct pressure, any other dressing, you need to, you need to reinforce that and ensure that that's going to make it out no matter what. Uh, you cannot have that guy arrive at, at uh, the next echelon of care with a quarter inch of blood in the back of that truck. That's not, that's not acceptable. Okay? So... Um, uh, I think we pretty well covered that uh, as far as a cat tourniquet. Um, my preference, uh, when possible, uh, just to reiterate, is uh, when possible, I go ahead and cut to it. I pressure the, uh, um, the extremity proximal to, in this case, well, I'm going to pr uh, pressure them over the femoral. I'm going to try to loop them, uh, get it up high. Um, uh, one thing I didn't, I didn't mention, and I want, I want to mention this, in this case, I'm, normally you want to go two to four inches above the injury side. If it's a discreet gunshot wound or something like that, two to four inches is going to be perfectly acceptable. The, the issue is that um, um, if it's massive soft tissue injury, you've got a, a traumatic amputation, um, you've got a lot of mush down here, and, and uh, you have no joint or a long bone below, um, you may have problems and may have to choke up beyond that, okay? You may have to go up above two to four inches and get it tightened. The other thing is, regardless, and this is, we're going to talk about this, you know, using the, the cat, but uh, it, 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 it applies for all tourniquets. If I apply this and I do it as tight as I need to, to, to get that, um, what I think, as tight as I can get it, and I'm, I still haven't shut off the bleeding, um, you know, I will, if I can't apply any more tension onto the windlass, then I'm going to go above that. I'm going to leave that in place, go above that, and put another, tur another tourniquet on it, okay? Um, another issue is on a lower, uh, lower extremity, uh, lower part of the lower extremity or uh, the forearm, uh, if you've got two bones there, and uh, frequently um, you've got some redundant vasculature in there, um, you, may not, you may have issue with getting that shut down and may have to go above the joint.